welcome back to the basement. So I'm working on a little project this morning where I need to make a series of a hundred holes in some one by four poplar and I need that hole to be precisely 2.55 inches. Now I have a decent set of hole saws that has various sizes and one of the sizes is two and a half and a hole saw would be a fine way to go about it but I really need something slightly bigger than two and a half. And because I'm talking about doing a hundred holes, I really don't have time to go through it at two and a half and then try to spend time enlarging it. I really need to get the hole just right the first time. Over here I have a decent set of Forstner bits. And a Forstner bit is a, a pleasure to use in the proper setting. But the largest size in my Forstner bit is two and an eighth. So I'm going to go to another tool that comes in handy from time to time, which is a circle cutter. Now this particular one is made in Japan, probably in the 70s, came with three different pilots. This particular pilot is an auger, you know, screw kind of a pilot, which I like a lot because it, it has a real nice bearing surface once that screw has gone through. And a circle cutter is a really handy tool to have in your arsenal because it can be used to make any size that you need and it makes a nice clean precision cut but if you don't know how to use a circle cutter then it is pretty much useless it will drive you crazy so I'm going to talk today a little bit about how to properly set up and use a circle cutter so there are two keys to successfully using a circle cutter a fly cutter like this. The first key is understanding how it's intended to cut so that you can properly set it. And then the second one is accurately setting the size without having to do a lot of trial and error. So first of all let's talk about how it cuts. As this bit swings toward us it is going to, it has a knife like this shape, so it's going to create a cut with the wood fiber sticking back that way. That is a fine thing to do, but if you imagine this being a wood chisel and driving it down in, you can only drive this thing down in here so far before it's going to get wedged. We need a way to clear the wood fibers out of the cut. Which is where this chisel comes in. This chisel is actually the opposite direction. So when this one has made a cut to the outside which having spun around is now over here so here are the wood fibers this one then will cut and clear out the wood fibers which leaves an empty kerf so it's very much like the teeth on a crosscut saw teeth on a crosscut saw have one tooth face to the left one tooth face to the right and between the two of them they create a curve. Well this is the same thing. Here's this chisel, here is this chisel, and so they create both sides of a curve. So we need to set this such that this sharp slice is to the very outside of the hole that we intend to cut. And this one should make a narrow curve but not narrower than the width of the chisel itself because otherwise this face is going to be striking the outside of the hole. So for my purposes uh, if, if the kerf is wider then you're asking the tool to do a little additional cutting that it doesn't really need to do. But I err on the side of being sure that the kerf is wide enough. So with this blade here which is uh, Oh, what is that? Probably three thirty seconds. It's a little more than a sixteenth, a little less than an eighth. I will create a kerf that is give or take an eighth of an inch wide, just to be sure that there's enough kerf. So then the second thing is, how do we set this? Well, here's what we know. Uh, like in our case, we want a hole that's two point five five zero inches. We know that from the center line to this outer edge should be half of that, which, uh, what's that going to be? 
So 1.275 from the center line out to this outer edge. So how do we find the center line? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We can simply measure whatever this shaft is. We can just measure it. And in this case, the shaft is uh, 0.311. So the center line is 0.311 this way. So our total distance, well, all we have to do is decide our radius and measure it such that the distance from here to here is our radius plus half of that shaft. So 0.311 divided by 2. So 0.155. So all we need to do is decide our desired radius and add 0.155. So 1.2750 plus 150. 1.430. So we're going to set this to 1.430. So we'll just set our caliper here. This caliper is about 25 bucks. You can get a digital caliper for 10 bucks if you, you know, watch on Amazon or whatever. Um, you may not be a machinist, but I can't imagine any worker of any type, woodworker, what have you that would not have use for a modern, highly accurate caliper. All right, so from the shaft out to here, 1.430 out to that shaft. And now this one, we want to be, we'll make it about 1.40. We'll make it about 30 thousandths to the inside, which will give us that little bit of a extra wide curve that we need. The exact width on this one is not nearly as important. This one is just cleaning up the kerf for us. This one is creating the final hole. So now let's mount it up, do a little test drill, and see what we get. All right, so a two by four is not necessarily the ideal test bed, but it's certainly an adequate test bed. We will cut, you know, whatever the depth we get out of this that'll be more or less halfway through we'll cut in that far and stop and take a look so there you can see the kerf it's creating there again I have a wider kerf really than is probably strictly necessary but as long as there's something to clear the chips out of the way And there is a full depth cut. As you can see, we have nice clean cuts on the walls and it didn't have any trouble at all clearing the chips. I'll flip it over and we'll cut this plug out just for the joy of it. Because the pilot hole goes all the way through, it's not too hard using the BXY table. By the way, if you're a woodworker, you need a mill drill. You need a round column mill slash drill press so that your drill press can do what this is doing and be moved incrementally within thousandths of an inch. I can't imagine trying to do woodworking without this, at least this particular machine tool. You don't need a metal lathe, but you need a mill drill. All right, here we go. And there you have some nice clean edges and a nice clean hole. I can barely even feel a rib in there. And let's see how we did for size. I don't know if you can see that, but there we are. 2.550 on the money. One final note. You don't want to run this thing at a crazy high speed. It has a lot of inertia. And you know, it's sticking out here pretty far. Um, compared to a hole saw, this is a very dangerous tool. If you were to get your hands up in here, it can grab clothing. It has these, you know, pretty much razor sharp chisels spinning around. This is not a tool to be messed with. I would be hesitant to want to chuck one of these up in a cordless drill and go after it, unless I really had confidence in, you know, the work being held still, my footing being solid. I'm much more comfortable using this in the drill press where everything is just locked down and stable. But there you have it. There is how you use a circle cutter, aka fly cutter, 
for accurate and clean holes of whatever size you want. P.S. As I was uh, doing some sample cutting, I realized that, one, that my interior cutter was a little bit longer than my exterior cutter. And the result was that the interior poked through before the exterior poked through. And by a happy coincidence, that's exactly what I want to happen. I want this disc to be able to drop into that hole and stop. So, having seen that happen, I took out the stock cutters that are just a, a sharp chisel point. And I made some replacement cutters, did a little experimenting, and substituted some replacement cutters to turn this into uh, more of a specialized cutting tool. So for the outer cutter, the one that cuts this clean outer rim of the final hole, I took a high-speed steel drill bit and I modified it so it can you know bolt onto the shank here and then I I made sure that it was clock such that I had this nice sharp corner that's uh, in line with the center of the drilling so this now has this 3 16 or approaching a, a quarter inch kerf that leaves a nice clean flat bottom for the outside cut because it's made of high-speed steel I didn't have to be real careful with overheating the steel and all that. Just kind of kept it more or less of a decent temperature. It was a real pain to drill through here. I used a carbide masonry bit that I, you know, have sharpened up to a much sharper point. Carbide masonry bit and a lot of pressure, and you can drill through high-speed steel like this. For the inner cutter, the hole was not as clean as I wanted it to be. So I took out the inner cutter and decided to make a substantially longer inner cutter. As you can see, the new one is uh, approaching an eighth of an inch longer than the original. And to make a, a new inner cutter, I thought about where have I got some, some decent steel around here. And I settled on this old Harbor Freight 10 inch saw blade. So I took a high speed friction cutter cut a slice out of the blade, leaving the carbide tooth embedded in it, and then took it to the grinder and massaged its profile a little bit so that it, you know, can go up in here. Sharpened the carbide tooth on the diamond cup wheel on the grinder, and so now this penetrates long before the outer does. So at this point, I have a nice clean inner hole. I have a nice clean outer hole. I have a relatively flat counter bore and the penetration you know doesn't suffer from a lot of tear out either. So not really the point of this video but with a specialized cutter insert you can also use this tool to produce a decent looking counter bore. And hey, thanks for watching.